Well, as we uh, dig into this message today, um, I just want to quickly mention uh, Pastor Tim Keller, Dr. Tim Keller. Uh, you've probably heard me mention that name before. He's a favorite uh, pastor, author of mine. And this message today, I just want to give him big props because his book, Generous Justice, was a gold mine of resource for me as I uh, put this message together. Uh, so big props to Tim Keller. Um, as a matter of fact, he tells this story. When Tim Keller was a uh, professor at a graduate school, he had a student named Mark Gronick. Mark, uh, I'm sorry, Gornick. Mark Gornick. And uh, he told uh, Pastor Tim that he was going to move to Sandtown. Now, Sandtown is one of the poorest and most dangerous neighborhoods in Baltimore, Maryland. So here's this, uh, this guy uh, in uh, seminary, graduate school, and he tells Professor Tim he's going to move to Sandtown. And Keller was really surprised about this, and he asked him why. And when he asked him why, Mark simply said, to do justice, to do justice. It, see, it had been decades since any white people had moved into Sandtown, and Mark was white. So, so for, the, for the first uh, couple of years that Mark was there, he said it was really touch and go, right? He said, he said that a reporter talked to him, and that he told the reporter, the police thought I was a drug dealer, and all the drug dealers thought... I was a policeman. So he said, I wasn't sure which one was going to shoot me first. Yet over the years, Mark, along with other leaders in the community, established a church and slowly a transformation in that neighborhood of Sandtown took place. Mark was living a very comfortable life, a very safe life. He became concerned about the most vulnerable, the marginalized. And so he and his family, they made a long term personal sacrifice in order to serve the needs of the poor. And that is, according to the Bible, what it means to do justice. We'll continue our series called The Essentials. And as we, uh, if, if you'd like to catch up on the series and the other messages, you can go to woodlands.cc and you can uh, see the rest of our messages there. They're all archived uh, you can catch up with. But today we're focusing on essential justice. So that's our title for today, essential justice. And our main scripture verse is really our main theme today. And that comes from Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah chapter 6, verse 8. We invite you to open up your Bible or your smartphone or your tablet. You have those with you. We'll also have the scriptures up here on the, uh, the, uh, the wall on these screens up here to my left and to my right. Micah 6, 8 reads this way. He says, he has, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's a verse that I would encourage every one of you to commit to memory. Uh, because as you'll see today, it's an absolute critical verse for us understanding the heart of God and understanding the way God wants us to live. As a matter of fact, Micah 6, 8 is actually a summary of how God wants us to live. To walk humbly with God is to know him intimately and to be attentive to what he desires and to what it is that God loves. And, and what does he desire? What does God love? Micah says to do justice and love mercy, which seem at first glance to be two different things, but they're not. The term mercy is the Hebrew word chesed, the Hebrew word chesed, and it means unconditional grace and compassion. That's what chesed is. It's a, a word used all over the Old Testament, okay? And, and, and it means unconditional grace and compassion. The word justice is the Hebrew word mishpat. Mishpat, all right? So you're all going to learn a Hebrew word today, a couple of them, right? Because I'm going to use them a lot. So in Micah 6, 8, Mishpat puts the emphasis on the action. Hesed or Chesed puts it on the attitude or the motive behind the action. So to walk with God then, we must do justice with merciful love. So God calls us to do justice but he wants it done with merciful love, okay? So uh, the word mishpat, in its various forms, it shows up more than 200 times in the Old Testament of Scripture, the Jewish um, Scriptures. Its most basic meaning is to treat people right, to treat people as unpartial, 
to treat people unbiased. Leviticus 24, 22 warns Israel to have the same mishpat, that is the rule of law, for the foreigner as for the native. Mishpat means acquitting or punishing uh, every person on the merits of the case, regardless of race or social status. In other words, two people who do the same crime should do the same time. But mishpat means more than just punishment for doing wrong. It also means to give people their rights. Deuteronomy 18 directs uh, the Hebrew people to support the priests of the tabernacle by a percentage of their income. Now this support is described as the priest's mishpat. And so as mishpat, that means it's their due or it's their right. Proverbs 31.9 says, defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Mishpat, then, is giving people what they are due, whether it's punishment or protection or support. So this is why, if you look at every place the word is used in the Old Testament, several classes of persons continually come up. And we read about it in Scripture. Here it is. Um, over and over again, Mishpat describes the taking up of the case and the cause of the widow, the orphans, the immigrants, and the poor. Those who have been called the quartet of the vulnerable. Zechariah 10, uh, 7, 10 through 11 gives us an example. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow, or the fatherless, or the immigrant, or the poor. You see, in ancient times, these four groups of people that I've mentioned, they had no social power whatsoever. They had no recourse for the injustices that were done to them. So they lived at barely survival level, and they were only days away from starvation if there was a famine or some kind of invasion or even a minor social unrest. Dr. Tim Keller says this, and I agree. He says, today this quartet would be expanded to include the refugee, the migrant worker, the homeless, many single parents, and many elderly people. You see, the mishpat, or uh, justness of a society, the, of, of our society, that's all of us, okay? We live together in a society, according to the Bible, is evaluated by how that society treats this group of people. Let that sink in for a minute. Evaluate yourself for a moment. How have you treated the orphan, the widow, the poor? immigrant, the migrant worker, if you will, the single mom, the elderly. God loves and defends those with the least economic and social power, and we should too. That is what it means to do justice. Why should we be concerned about the vulnerable ones? Why should we? Very simply, because God is concerned about the vulnerable ones. Now take a look at some of these passages. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 146, verses 7 through 9. We read, He executes justice, that's mishpat, for the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. He lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves those who live justly. The Lord watches over the immigrant and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. It is striking to see how often God is introduced as the defender of these vulnerable groups. Now, don't miss the significance of this, okay? I mean, we, when, when, when people ask me on occasion where I've gone to other churches to speak and that sort of thing, when people ask me, how do I want to be introduced you know, I, I have a way that I, that I tell them. Now, I could tell them, well, I want you to introduce me as, uh, you know, Daniel Wentworth, father uh, or, or a husband of Ruth, all right? 
I think because that's one of my roles. I could ask them to introduce me, hey, introduce him as, as Daniel Wentworth, father of Brian and Travis, grandfather of five, okay, because that, that's another hat that I wear, okay? I could ask them to introduce me, Daniel Wentworth, uh, former NBA great, Hall of Famer, you know, all-time leading scorer. Two of those three examples are true. I'll let you decide which one, you know, was not, was not accurate. But the way I usually have them introduce me is very simply, uh, this is Daniel Wentworth. He's a pastor of the Woodlands Community Church. Because, you know what, I mean, although there are many things, that's the main thing I spend my time doing, is being the pastor of this church. So appreciate then how significant it is that the biblical writers introduce God as, Psalm 68, 4 and 5, a father to the fatherless and a defender of the widows. This is one of his top priorities in the world, folks. He identifies with the powerless. He takes up their cause. As a, uh, there was a, a, a scholar, a biblical scholar from Sri Lanka. His name is Vinath Ramachandra. Vinath Ramachandra. And uh, he calls this whole thing a scandalous justice. It's a scandalous justice. And he writes that in virtually all the ancient cultures of the world, the power of the gods was channeled through and identified with the elites of society. So, ancient times, all the other gods you read about, you read about in Greek mythology, in Roman mythology, when you hear about the gods of other countries that you read about, they all channeled or communicated through the elites of society, according to Ramachandra. And he says that... Um, uh, the elites included the kings, the priests, and the military captains, but not the outcasts. To oppose the leaders of society, Ramachandra writes, then was to oppose the gods. But here, in Israel's vision, he goes on to say, it is not high-ranking males, but orphan, the widow, the stranger, with whom Yahweh takes his stand. So from ancient times, the God of the Bible, he stood out from the God of all other religions as just, a just God who was on the side of the powerless. Proverbs 31.8 says, Speak up for those who cannot speak up for themselves, for the rights of all those who are destitute. If, if God's character, folks, includes a zeal for justice that leads, that leads him to have the most tender love and closest involvement with the socially weak, what then should God's people be like? We must be people who are passionately concerned for the weak and the vulnerable. You see, God injected his concern for justice into the very heart of Israel's worship and community life. Jeremiah 22, 3 says, This is what the Lord says, Do what is just and right. Rescue from the hand of the oppressor the one who has been robbed. Do no wrong or violence to the immigrant, the fatherless, or the widow, and do not shed innocent blood in this place. You see, Israel was charged to create a culture of social justice for the poor and vulnerable because it would reveal God's glory. It would reveal God's character to the world. Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, in verses 6 to 8, I'll summarize here, it's a key text where Israel is told that they should keep God's commands so that all the nations of the world will look at the justice and peace of their society based on God's laws and be attracted to God's wisdom and His glory. In other words, doing justice to the most vulnerable of our society, showing that kind of love, showing that kind of generosity, showing that kind of, of encouragement and support, it literally becomes an evangelism tool. It becomes an, a, 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 an opportunity or a way of witness to others 
that God is great. This is why it says in Proverbs 14, 31, whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. If believers in God don't honor the cries and claims of the poor, we don't honor Him because we hide His beauty from the world. When we pour ourselves out for the poor, the world takes notice. And there's been incredible examples of this throughout history that I don't have time to go into today. We must have a strong concern for the poor. But there is more to biblical justice, okay, we get more insight from a second Hebrew word that can be translated as being just, although most often it is translated as being righteous. And that Hebrew word is the word tzedakah, tzedakah. You'll see it up here on the screen if you want to take a picture of it so you know I'm saying it. The word tzedakah and uh, it references a life of right relationships. A life of right relationships. Bible scholar Alec Motyer, he defines righteous as those right with God and therefore committed to putting right all other relationships. Now, I hope you're grasping that. To be right with God is to be right with all other relationships. Folks, that's a mouthful. I really hope you'll sit and ponder on that and think about the the, the height and the breadth and the width and the depth of that statement. To be right with God is to be right with all relationships. This means then that biblical righteousness is inevitably social because it is about relationships. When most modern people think of the word righteousness what do we, in the Bible, what do we do? Well, typically, our first thought is of private morality. And I confess, that's been my definition of it for, for most of my life. Yeah, a change has happened in me deeply, really, since coming here to Woodland seven years ago, when I've started to understand more about what the righteousness of God is really about. But typically, uh, again, modern people think of righteousness as a personal or a private morality. We think of things like, well, I'm righteous if I'm diligent in prayer and fasting and reading my Bible every day. We think, well, I'm, I'm being righteous if I abstain from inappropriate sexuality. We think we're righteous if we don't do certain things, if we don't drink too much, if we don't smoke, if we don't swear right? Um, If we don't do drugs, then then we're being a righteous person. Now, by the way, all those things that I just mentioned are are, are good things. They're healthy, and and they will uh, help you in 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 your spiritual life and in your life in general. But in the Bible, tzedakah refers to day-to-day living in which a person conducts all relationships in family and society with fairness generosity and equity all relationships not just the people that look like us it is not surprising then to discover that Chedekah and mishpat are brought together multiple times in the bible these two words roughly correspond uh, to what some have called primary and rectifying justice now, rectifying just, if you rectify something, what do you do? Well, you correct it, right? Or you, or you uh, repair it. That's what it means to rectify. Rectifying justice is mishpat, and it means punishing wrongdoers and caring for the victims of unjust treatment. That's that kind of justice. Primary justice, or tzedakah, is behavior that, if it was universal, it would literally render rectifying justice unnecessary because everyone would be living in right relationship to one another. Though Chedekah is primarily about being in right relationship with God, the righteous life that results is profoundly social. And that's why in the New Testament, when Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? 
He said the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. Now, they didn't ask him what the second command was, but he could not separate the two because they go so intimately together. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's social, right? So there's this spiritual, theological connection with God, this personal thing that we have. But then that is manifested through our social network. All the people that we come into contact with throughout the day and throughout our lives. So a passage in the book of Job, it illustrates what this kind of righteous or just living person looks like. So Job chapter 29, verses 12 to 17, uh, again, read along with me. I rescued the poor who cried for help, and the fatherless who had none to assist him. The man who was dying blessed me. I made the widow's heart sing. I put on righteousness, Chedekah, as my clothing, and justice, Mishpat, was my robe and my turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. By the way, I just got to say this. Next time you see somebody wearing a turban, you know, you might, if you, depending on where you come from in life, you might have some critical or prejudiced ideas about that person. Just think about Job. Job wore a turban all the time. All right? So that might just put it in perspective for us. I was why I, he said, I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy. I took up the case of the immigrant. I broke the fangs of the wicked and snatched the victims from their teeth. Uh, uh, biblical scholar Francis I. Anderson, he points out in his commentary on the book of Job that this is one of the most important texts in Scripture for studying Israelite ethics. He says it is a complete picture of how a righteous Israelite was supposed to live. And to Job, who wrote these words, right conduct is almost always social. In Job's conscience, to neglect doing good to any fellow human being of whatever rank, whatever class, would be a grievous offense to God. In Job's inventory of his life, we see all the elements of what it means to live justly, right? And to do justice, as we see Micah 6, 8 says. We see direct rectifying justice when Job says, I took up the case of the immigrant. I broke the fangs of the wicked, and I snatched the victims from their teeth. This means that he confronted people who exploited the vulnerable. He didn't sit back passively and just say, well, I'm not evil. Well, I don't do that. He confronted the ones who exploited the vulnerable. In our world, this could mean prosecuting the men who batter, exploit, and rob poor women. But it could also mean Christians respectfully, and I say this very carefully, very respectfully putting pressure on local police departments until they respond to calls and crimes as quickly in the poor neighborhoods as they do in the prosperous side of town. Just think on that. It could be a little controversial, I know. Everybody okay? Job also gives us many examples of what we could call primary justice or righteous living. He says that he is eyes to the blind and he is feet to the lame as a father to the needy. You see, to be a father, what does that mean to be a father? Many of you are fathers sitting out here today. To be a father means that you care for the needs of the poor as a parent would meet the needs of their children. In our world, this means taking the time personally to meet the needs of the handicapped, the elderly, the hungry, the orphan in our neighborhoods and in our circle of influence. Or it could mean to establish new nonprofits who would serve the interests of these classes of people. But it could also mean groups of families from the more prosperous 
side of town, adopting a public school in the poor community, and making generous donations of money and pro bono work in order to improve the quality of education in those neighborhoods. You see, in, 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 in um, chapter 31, Job, uh, he continues uh, this kind of talk. And in chapter 31, he gives us more details about a righteous or a just life. Uh, and, and, and I'm just going to kind of summarize this with a few key verses. He says that he fulfills the desires of the poor. And that's verse 16. And, and if you've got Job 31 opened up, I encourage you to highlight that word desires. Okay, underline it in your Bible. Write it down if you're taking notes. That's in Job 31, 16, the desires of the poor. You see, desire means that he is not just meeting the basic needs for food and shelter. It means that he turns the poor man's life into a delight. This certainly goes beyond what we call today charity. Job, Job is not just giving handouts, folks, but rather he has become deeply involved in the life of the poor, the orphaned, the handicapped. His goal for the poor is a life of delight for them, and his goal for the widow is that her eyes will no longer be weary. And you understand that, because if you're a single mom, you get this better than most, because single moms often have to work one job, maybe two jobs, maybe three jobs. they got to be mom and dad to their kids. They're tired all the time. Their eyes are weary. And Job says that he wants the widow or the single mom's eyes to no longer be weary because of his involvement in their life. He is not at all satisfied with halfway measures for the needy people in his community. When these two words, Chedekah and Mishpat, are tied together as they are over three dozen times throughout Scripture, the English expression that best conveys these two words is social justice. Now that's very, very important. Very, for some of you, you're kind of like, what's the big deal? Yeah, for others though, you have to understand because, see, I grew up in churches where people were, were, were suspicious of that phrase, social justice. They would often say things like, just preach the word. Don't talk about that social justice stuff. If you just preach the word, that's all you need. And you know what? Over my lifetime, I've realized when you preach the word, you will preach social justice. Because social justice is the word. Everybody okay at home? All right. Hang with me. It is, it is a revealing exercise to find texts of Scripture where the words are paired and then translate them using this phrase, social justice. Here are two, just quick ones. In Psalm 33, 5, it says, The Lord loves, okay, Chedekah, Mishpat, the Lord loves social justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let, let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness and social justice on earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. You see, in English, the word charity, it conveys a good but an optional activity that we do. Charity cannot be a requirement because then it wouldn't be charity, right? In the scriptures, though, gifts to the poor are called acts of righteousness, and you know who called gifts to the poor acts of righteousness? I'll give you a hint. You'll find this in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, which is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus. Jesus doesn't call it charity. He calls it acts of righteousness. You see, not giving generously then, it's, this is not stingy. 
but unrighteousness. It's a violation of God's law. In Job 31, he calls every failure to help the poor a sin. Offensive to God's splendor, verse 23, and deserving of judgment and punishment, verse 28. Remarkably, folks, Job is stressing that it would be a sin against God to think of his wealth as belonging to himself alone. Now that reminds us of last week's message on essential finance, where we talked about how everything belongs to God. To not share his bread, Job said, his assets with the poor would be unrighteous. It would be a sin against God, and therefore, by definition, a violation of God's justice. Another passage from the prophecy of Ezekiel makes a very similar list to the one that we see in Job 31. And we're bringing this home here. We're wrapping it up. Ezekiel 18, 5, and then verses 7 through 8. It says, most interesting is how, or, or most interesting that I want to point out is how the text pairs, he does not commit robbery. Okay, again, I'm summarizing this passage, so you have to look it up, uh, uh, you know, later. But in this text of Ezekiel, Ezekiel combines or he, he, um, he pairs these phrases. He does not commit robbery with uh, the, the, the phrase, the descriptive clause. He gives food and clothing to the poor. So the implication in Ezekiel is this. If you do not actively and generously Share your resources with the poor. You're a robber. That's the word. That's the word. And if you're feeling convicted, my friends, please do not feel alone. Because I am too. In no way, shape, or form am I living up to everything that I'm preaching today. I am on a journey just like you are. And my prayer is that we'll take this journey together. Ezekiel and Job make radical generosity the marks of living justly. You see, the just person lives a life of honesty, of equity, and generosity in every aspect of her or his life. If you're trying to live life in accordance with the Bible, the concept and the call to justice are absolutely inescapable. We do justice when we value all human beings as creation of Almighty God. Doing justice includes not only the righting of wrongs, but generosity and social concern, especially toward the poor and the vulnerable. This kind of life reflects the character of God. It consists of a broad range of activities from being fair and honest, dealings with people in daily life, to regular, radically generous giving of your time, your resources, to activism that seeks to end specific forms of injustice, violence, and oppression. Now, we're going to continue our study of essential justice next week. And I want you to know that I have big expectations for Woodlands folks. I want you to know that God is dealing with me. And I want you to know, I've talked to many of you. God's dealing with many of you at Woodlands. And I want you to know, something's starting to happen. Something is starting to move. And it better. Because the church has a challenge in our world today like never before. And we need to rise to be biblical Christians. And we'll talk a lot more about this next week and in the weeks to come. But as we move toward that, we all know that everything, everything that God does, He does in response to prayer. We need to be people of prayer, people praying, praying, hitting our knees, asking the Lord, breaking ourselves, humbling ourselves before God, being open to admitting our sins, our faults, You know, we have a group of people here at Woodlands who have been praying every night 
on Zoom for the past, I think, three months maybe. And every August, you may be aware, for the sixth or seventh time, we are doing 21 days of prayer in August. Because we already have people at Woodlands who are doing Zoom prayer every night, we are going to combine 21 days of prayer with them. So 21 days of prayer this year is going to be online. Um, We're going to do it through Zoom. You'll be able to get the Zoom link through the e-news. Now, if you are not signed up to the e-news at Woodlands, by all means, please, please do this, because that's how we communicate so much of the information of what happens at Woodlands. It's very simple. If you just open up our website, those at home, go to woodlands.cc. And when it opens up, a banner opens up on the right, on the home page. It automatically opens. Just fill that out. It'll take you literally 15 seconds. And then you'll be on our, on our email um, uh, list, and you'll receive the e-news. And we're going to send you the link through the e-news this week. And on Friday night, we're going to kick off 21 days of prayer with an all-night prayer vigil on Zoom. From 7 in the evening till 7 in the morning, prayer is going to go nonstop. Because, folks, if we want God to take us seriously, we better take prayer seriously. Now, it doesn't mean you have to stay up all night with the prayer. Man, if you can tune in for an hour, two hours, an hour here, an hour there, you know, if you can't do all night, man, don't blow it off. Don't say, well, I can't do all night, so I'm not going to join. No, you can join in for an hour whenever you want. But, folks, we've got to pray. We've got to be people of prayer. And I invite you all to, to, to tune in. Those of you at home, I hope you're taking notes on this. We invite you to tune in to pray beginning this Friday. That kicks off our 21 days of prayer. And for 21 days, I'm going to be on that Zoom link every night at 7 o'clock to pray. And I hope you all will too because we need God. I'm not smart enough to figure out everything going on in our world today. And my guess is you're not smart enough either. We need God because he is smart enough. He's done it before. He'll do it again. 